thank you. Uh, I have enjoyed my time here in Brazil. It's the first time I've been to Brazil or South America for that matter. And uh, I've got a neighbor that lives five houses down from me. He's from Brazil. And when I told him I was coming to Brazil, he got very excited, got a big smile on his face and said, you're going to love it. And, uh, and he's right. I have really loved it here. Uh, you've got wonderful food. I've eaten way too much. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I've enjoyed the scenery. It's very, very beautiful. And you people are a beautiful people, not only externally, but on the inside, too. Uh, and I've picked up a few words that I've been here. I know how to say, wait a minute. Uh, I know how to say thank you, uh, very good, and pain. So I'm going to try this in a sentence, see how I do. Arigato for returning this Muchibon Saturday afternoon when there is so much Muchibon weather outside <laughs> to attend what will hopefully be a Muchibon lecture on diathermy. Hopefully my lecture will not cause much door. How'd I do? Okay, all right, thank you. <laughs> I want to talk to you about a modality that I've been using for about 10 years, and I really, really enjoy this modality. It's amazing the things that you can do with pulse shortwave diathermy. And a lot of people don't have it, and a lot of people don't know how to use it. So what I want to do today is show a little bit of how to use diathermy, and then present several case studies to you where I have had very good effects with restoring people's range of motion with diathermy and stretching or joint mobilizations. So if we first of all look at diathermy, what it really means, the prefix dia means through, and the suffix therm means heat. And so together, it's through heat. It's heating through the tissues, and it goes very deep in the tissues. Okay, what is diathermy then? It's the application of high frequency electromagnetic energy that is primarily used to generate heat into the body tissues. It involves transmission and absorption of electromagnetic energy by the body. Heat is produced by the resistance of tissue to the passage of energy. So here we have here we have a picture of a diathermy machine. This up here, whoa, I'm going too far. I'm hitting the wrong ones. Okay, this is an important slide to mention. Simply put, I think all of you know what ultrasound is, and you have used a lot of ultrasound. But simply put, diathermy is like a giant ultrasound machine. Whereas ultrasound will heat an area as small as, uh, oh, a a ketchup packet or a salt package. Uh, diathermy will heat an area as big as a salad plate. So that's the value of the diathermy. So here's the anatomy of a shortwave diathermy device. This is the induction drum electrode of the applicator. And of course, all of this in here is the generator itself. It's the guts of the machine. So the anatomy, again, continuing, these coils here, these copper coils, basically, start circulating an electromagnetic current through there. And these come in variety of shapes. This is what's called a pancake coil. This is what is called a hinged unit with coil, copper coils in each flap. And probably the most common, if you look out here in the hall today, they have a diathermy device and it has what's called an induction drum. So this is the induction drum and is put over the area to heat large areas of the body. So shortwave units can either be a one drum or a two drum device. A one drum is called a monode and a dual drum is called a dipole. Now, the, there's a lot of advantages of having a two-drum unit. You can, one, treat two people at a time, or you can also treat a larger area, like the front and the back that is showing on this woman. 
Inside the applicator drum is a single copper electrode with high conductivity, and it's shaped into a coil. The device then runs on, in the United States, 110 volts. I don't know what it would be here. But electricity from a wall outlet, the generator takes alternating current electricity and converts it into radio frequency, which is usually 27.12 megahertz. The radio frequency then passes through an inductive applicator drum. So this is a little of the physiology behind how it works. As a high frequency electrical energy is applied to the coil, a fluctuating magnetic field is generated around this coil. Then as the, as the radio frequency exits the drum, an oscillating magnetic field is produced in the body. As a magnetic field passes through the tissues, it causes a reaction in tissues producing both thermal and non-thermal effects. There's two ways in which diathermy heats tissues, and the first is known as the dipole reaction, in, and there's also eddy currents. With the dipole reaction, a dipole is a molecule whose ends carry opposite charges. The electromagnetic wave produced by shortwave diathermy causes rotation of these dipoles. As these rotate, friction occurs, which results in heat. When a low impedance resistance conductor such as a body part is placed within the magnetic field, electrical currents are induced within the, that conductor. Within the body part, small circular currents or eddies move around in concert with the changes in the direction of magnetic field. The rotation and movement and vibration of the eddy currents in the tissues results in heat. The greatest concentration of eddy currents occurs in tissues of high conductivity, such as blood and muscle. So again, eddy currents are a magnetic field that generates small circular electrical fields. These fields vibrate and increase cell membrane permeability, which causes heat. Now I have a little analogy here. Uh, this little baby here, as you can see, is in a nice tub of water and he's shaking his bottle there or whatever. Kind of looks like my colleague Jim last night at the bar. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, imagine putting your leg in a warm whirlpool bath with the turbine turned off. You immediately feel some heat. But then you turn the turbine on and the area gets warmer. So this is in a sense what diathermy does. As you turn that on, electromagnetic waste are produced in the body. As they hit molecules, they turn them around, they hit it on each other, and the friction then causes some heat. So energy distribution and heating effects upon various tissues via shortwave diathermy. With shortwave diathermy, most of the energy is absorbed in the muscle, as you can see. Very little is absorbed in the fat, most of it is absorbed in the muscle. Very little will hit the bone. Now microwave diathermy, which is not allowed, not allowed to be used in the United States currently, it will heat fat more than muscle, okay? And so really what we're after in physical therapy and athletic therapy is to heat the area so that you can get the deep heating. And this heating goes up to about three to five centimeters deep. Whereas if you get in a whirlpool or a hot pack, the appropriate heat only is produced about one centimeter deep. Okay, so this is the value of this particular device. Now shortwave units can either be continuous or pulsed. However, most of the devices are pulsed. So this represents a pulsed wave that is going along in the tissues. Now there are some continuous diathermy devices some of these can overheat the tissue if you're not careful. So make sure if you're using continuous shortwave diathermy that you turn it down so that it does not damage the tissues. Always what you want to do as you're treating is ask the patient how does it feel. If they say it feels very hot, then you need to turn it down. 
If they see it, say it, I can hardly feel anything, if you want the thermal effects, then you need to turn it up until they have a feeling of uh, gentle warmth. So there are a lot of physiological effects of shortwave diathermy, and a lot of these are those of heat in the tissues. So you can get an increased blood flow up to 30 milliliters of, of per gram of tissue, and that's comparable to uh, exercise. You might say, well, just have them go out and run. Well, what if their knee's giving them a bad time and they've got too much pain in their knee? Then you can use shortwave diathermy to increase the blood flow to the area. You get an increased metabolism, which also is effective in healing tissues. Am I talking too fast? Slow down? Okay, I will slow down. Okay. Um, there's a decreased muscle spasm, too, that can uh, occur in the tissues. Uh, decreased pain, or door. <laughs> Increased white blood cell infiltration. There's a realignment of collagen fibers and collagen content to increase tensile strength in the tissues. Uh, this is just a nice picture that I like showing a, uh, a thermometer going through a muscle. And this is my goal, is I want to heat up that muscle before I stretch it. Some other uh, continuation of physiological effects of shortwave diathermy. You can get an increase in fibroblastic activity. And as, as Ed mentioned th this morning, fibroblastic activity is very, very important in healing the tissue. It can also get some collagen deposition. Can get new capillary growth, of course, that helps in healing. Uh, analgesia, a shortwave diathermy is very helpful for relieving pain. And then there's some healing that can occur, and that's where you get this pearl, uh, pearl formation uh, produced when microorganisms in the red blood cells in the serum become oriented in chain formation parallel to the lines of the electromagnetic field. Now there are some indications with shortwave diathermy. First of all, what is this? Any ideas? That's the Achilles tendon. And that had so much, and some of you say, yeah, I knew that, why didn't you say? Okay, anyway, um, this is an Achilles tendon that had a lot of inflammation on it, and so it had a lot of scar tissue. Normally, it should look like this. It will have a little bit of blood supply. This is a damaged portion. It's very gray. It's got a lot of scar tissue. This was so bad that the surgeon decided to go in and make an incision and then scrape away this damaged parts and dying cells to restore this to normal uh, situation. Well, why would I use this picture? Because one of the uh, indications is strains, and strain is, is obviously a tear of a muscle or a tendon. Sprains, which would be a damage to a ligament. Uh, contusions, obviously a, a, a blow to the area, some, some pressure on an area that can cause bruising. And then you can get a tendonitis, inflammation of the tendon. A bursitis, you can use this on, on inflamed bursa. And obviously one big indication is pain relief. And then one last one I, I uh, forgot to add here is it can assist in the resolution of inflammatory infiltrates and oxidates. Uh, areas that are ischemic can have problems too with, uh, with diathermy anesthetic areas, because then you wouldn't be able to tell if the diathermy was too hot. And areas of effusion, that can cause some problem with, with water-filled areas and so forth uh, that may actually cause some burning to occur in the tissues. Eyes or contact lenses, I don't know why they ever even list that as a contraindication. You, no one would put it over the eyes. That just doesn't make sense. Uh, no, don't use it on the testes or the ovaries uh, or caution over the pelvis during pregnancy. 
more contraindications for shortwave diathermy. Over moist wound dressings, not a good idea to use. Fever. If you've already got a fever, a fairly high temperature, if you heat a large area of the body, that's just going to cause the temperature to go up even more. Epiphyseal plates. Now, we don't really know what would happen. For example, with ultrasound, it used to be a contraindication to use over epiphyseal plates. However, that was when they used 3 watts per centimeter squared with 1 megahertz ultrasound. That would easily overheat the tissue. Now, uh, what they have found in physical therapy since then is that if you use uh, ultrasound over an epiphyseal plate, a growth plate, as long as you don't turn the intensity up over one watt per centimeter squared, you should be okay. However, we don't know what would happen with diathermy, and y there's no way you can research it. You're not going to get 50 kids and say, we're going to try to fry your epiphyses on 25 of you, and the other, we're not going to do anything. So it's just a thing that we cannot study. Cancer. The problem with using diathermy over cancer is again it increases the metabolism and that obviously could cause the cancer in the tumor to spread. Pacemakers. Don't use a diathermy in the, in the vicinity of a pacemaker. That means uh, I wouldn't even let someone with a pacemaker go in the same room. Again, we don't know what would happen. That's something we just can't research because people might die and there goes your funding. So uh, you have to be very, very careful when somebody has a pacemaker. And it's best not to use ultrasound or diathermy in the area of a pacemaker. Metal implants. This is so important to mention that you're not to use diathermy over metal implants because what might happen is it is hypothesized that the metal will actually heat up when the diathermy hits it. So according to the FDA, all of the textbooks and all of the journal articles have to say, do not use shortwave diathermy over metal plates. Okay? Now, I've done some over metal plates, and I'm going to show you today. And the people were just fine. So stay tuned. The typical diathermy unit is very, very easy to use. The first thing that you do is you simply hit the on button, so you turn it on, and then you go over and you adjust the pulse rate, so this will go anywhere from 100 up to 800 hertz, or pulses per second, and then you adjust the pulse width. There's a little button you push to adjust the pulse width. You can go anywhere from 100 up to 400 uh, microseconds and that can provide some very very good treatment for the individual uh, and then you simply push the button and the treatment goes typically a diathermy treatment will be 15 to 20 minutes we have found significant heating after 20 minutes of shortwave diathermy heating to decay rates of pulse shortwave diathermy well, years ago we did a study where we put temperature probes in the calf of some of our students. Okay, These temperature probes are about a 16 gauge. They went in about 3 centimeters into the muscle, 3 to 4 centimeters into the muscle, and uh, they were actually 3 centimeters deep from the skin. And what we did is we applied pulse shortwave diathermy. And on average, the temperature went up 4.5 degrees. That was quite a good temperature increase. So if you're starting with a baseline of, say, 36, you can get them up to 40.5 in a matter of 20 minutes. Well, what we did with this study is we compared it, or we also found the decay rate, if I can get it here, is two to three times slower than ultrasound. That's what means when we turn an ultrasound machine off, the temperature starts to go down slowly. It does, or excuse me, fairly rapidly. It doesn't go down slowly. You can't give an ultrasound treatment and wait a half hour and then stretch the people. It's not going to work. You immediately need to begin applying your stretch. 
because within about 10 minutes, you're going to lose most of that heat. Well, with diathermy, we found out it's, it's two to three times greater. So often you have 20 minutes with diathermy to perform your heating, your uh, stretching, or joint mobilizations. Now to continue on with this, um, a lot of people treat large areas with ultrasound and don't feel bad if you do that because you just don't know better. Um, but years ago when I went to school, the parameters for ultrasound was, oh, use it for five or 10 minutes, okay. What intensity? Oh, 1.5 watts per centimeter squared. Okay, how big of an area? Oh, whatever it takes. Um, when I was uh, training to be a uh, athletic therapist for the 2002 Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City, uh, one of the sites I worked with is Canadian skating team. And I went into, a, uh, into the clinic and saw an athletic therapist giving an ultrasound treatment over to the entire back of one of the ice skaters. That's just not going to do very good. So. What I've recommended is you heat an area twice the size of the sound head. So what we did is we compared diathermy heating and ultrasound heating. So for this particular study down here, what I did is I put the drum on the tissue, then I traced the area that that drum would cover. I then did a 20-minute uh, diathermy treatment. Then we had the people go home and come back two days later, and we treated an area, they had this left the, the little marker left on the tissue, then we treated that whole area with diathermy, with, with ultrasound. Now let's see what the results were. This is quite interesting. There we go. Okay, at three centimeters deep, Pulse shortwave diathermy heats the muscle underneath the entire drum. The center probe here was an increase of 4.6 degrees Celsius. That's very, very vigorous heating. Whereas on the edges of the drum, it heated the temperature up to 3.2 degrees. Now what happened when we did ultrasound over this large area? The temperature actually dropped two tenths of a degree. So if you've been using ultrasound, to heat large areas, don't feel bad. It just didn't heat them up at all. But now you want to limit it to twice the size of the sound head. So why do we have diathermy? When we want to apply deep heat up to five centimeters deep in a large area. A hot pack won't work because why? It won't go deep enough, okay? Now we get to the fun things. I want to share with you several cases that I've worked on in the past 10 years where I have used pulse shortwave diathermy to heat the tissue and then provide joint mobilizations to get the range of motion back. Let's use an analogy of a plastic spoon. Let's say that each of us decide to go out on a cold winter in Brazil and as we're out in the mountains, I pass around hot chocolate to each of you. So you've got your little hot chocolate packet here, your cocoa packet. And then I hand out to you water in a cup that's almost boiling. And then I give you a plastic spoon. So you pour the cocoa powder in the cup and then you put the spoon in to start to stir. What happens is that spoon gets hot. It'll start to bend. So what we're saying, as the collagen fibers get warm, they release some of their cross bands and so you can stretch the tissues. Now what happens as soon as that spoon gets cold? You can break it. Well, so what we try to do with, ultra, with diathermy is to heat up the tissues, apply a stretch or joint mobilization, and then what I do immediately after my joint mobilizations is I apply an ice pack and a nice ice wrap because I want to get this what's called constant deformation or plastic deformation of the tissues. So let's talk about some of my favorite cases. This first one was a 48-year-old uh, a firefighter and a paramedic and it was due to a six-month-old distal humerus fracture. This man was also my Mormon bishop, which is kind of being like a, uh, an Assembly of God minister or a Catholic priest. 
okay? He was also my, my neighbor. I really thought an awful lot. I loved this man and I wanted him to get better. He could not pass his firefighter's license uh, test to keep his firefighter's license. And he was also in the military and flew uh, helicopters. He could not reach the controls normally from where he was sitting down. So what we needed to do was restore his range of motion. When he came into my lab, he had full flexion. But he was lacking um, 17 degrees of extension in the arm that had been broken. So what we did, show a picture here. This is a picture of him then when he would lie down on the table. This is how much his elbow was bent. And for six months, he'd been trying to get that straight with no, with no luck. So to heat the tissue, we did an application of pulse shortwave diathermy, 15 minutes at 800 pulses per second and 400 microsecond pulse duration. Now I have up here note, in prior research, this is shown to raise the temperature over 4 degrees Celsius. So I would do the diathermy, and as soon as the diathermy was over, I would do the joint mobilizations. This is actually showing some of the joint mobilizations performed. Um, these aren't nearly as good as this one. I found this to be an excellent one. What I do is I put the forearm through my thighs, I cramp down and pull traction. And then, with the other arm, I stabilize the, uh, the uh, radius and ulna, and then I, I um, push down, I do anterior glides of the humerus. This will really bring back extension. And the reason I'm doing this with gloves on is they're biking gloves and they have padding on them so it's more comfortable for the patient. Okay, this is kind of a busy slide, but realize for six months he'd been stuck. His elbow was frozen. Before the treatment, he was at 17 degrees of extension. After the treatment, he got to 8 degrees extension. He came in two days later. He started at 6 degrees. He ended it at 4 degrees. He came in three days or two days later. He started at 6 degrees, and afterwards he was zero. So in three treatments, he was restored to normal range of motion. Now he could hyperextend his other elbow to minus two. So we got the minus two after day four. He was thrilled, I was thrilled. This was very, very good information to, uh, to note. So again, with just three treatments of pulse shortwave diathermy and joint mobilizations, he gained 17 degrees of range of motion or got to normal. This is him before. This is showing the after picture. That's one case. This is showing the side view of that. Now, several years ago, there was an article in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery that said obtaining the last five degrees of extension when you perform, uh, when you've had surgery or broken a limb, is extremely difficult to get back in the elbow. I mean, you might think about all the patients you've treated and how hard it is to get back that last five degrees of extension. We've had some luck doing that. Now, remember I mentioned do not use shortwave diathermy over metal. However, I had this crazy idea some years ago that if we could heat the tissue around the metal using pulse shortwave diathermy, maybe that could help restore range of motion in people that have implanted, implanted metal rods and plates. So this research and these patients have been only treated with the Megapulse 2 by Accelerated Care Plus out of Reno, Nevada at the USA. Uh, we use 48 watts. Now these results may not be found in other shortwave diathermy devices and therefore may be contraindicated until further research has been proven otherwise. Daniel, stand up just a minute so everyone can turn around and see how attractive you are. Everyone, this is Daniel and he works for Ebermed. Two years ago, Daniel had a soccer injury that broke his distal fibula and then they surgically put a plate in his, on his fibula that was probably 12 centimeters long. 
just two days ago, we used the Ibramed pulse shortwave diathermy unit for 15 minutes and we heated up that joint line with the metal in there. And did the metal burn you? No, it did not get hot. So here's something that we did right here in Brazil. And I'm not saying that necessarily you should do it, but it can be done, okay, uh, if you have metal in the areas. Again, though, this is an FDA thing. Thank you, Daniel, very much. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, we found that when you put, we had an individual who uh, was a construction worker and he fell two stories onto the cement. He fractured his humerus. They, at, they healed that or they, they did surgery and put a metal rod in his humerus with several screws. He came into our lab and we wanted to test and see if indeed this metal plate heated up. So we put a temperature probe in till it touched the metal. Then we put another temperature probe in on the muscle just as deep as the metal. Then we did pulse shortwave diathermy at 48 watts. The temperature on the metal went up 4.5 degrees Celsius. The temperature on the muscle, you guessed it, 4.5 degrees Celsius. This metal was not overheating. It wasn't damaging the tissue. Now you have to be careful, never use this on the pins or the rods that have circles on them because the electromagnetic energy can be like an antenna on those rings and that can cause some overheating. It was quite remarkable. Now this was my first patient. Even before I did any research on metal and shortwave diathermy, this is the first patient I dealt with. Um, I called one of my friends who I worked for years ago uh, as a physical therapy assistant. And I said, I've got this crazy idea with diathermy. Send me your most difficult case that you haven't had much luck on. And he told me about a case that he had. And so I gave her a call. Uh, she had been to him for 40 treatments, and she was still lacking about 20, 20 to five to 30 degrees of extension in the elbow. What had happened was a horrible accident. In June 3rd of 2002, her elbow was shattered by an airbag during a car accident. She had surgery that same day, but unfortunately the implanted screws and metal failed, so she had surgery again three weeks later. The hardware didn't work, as I mentioned, so another surgery was performed. The doctor said this, this, uh, this shatter was so bad it was like trying to screw cornflakes back together. Now this is the picture of her x-ray right here. So you can see right here, this is a 8 centimeter long screw. This is a metal plate, and these are several screws in that area. No one in their right mind would do pulse shortwave diathermy over that. But sometime I've been accused of being a little crazy and going on the edge. And so I gave her a call and I said, when can you come into the lab? She says, I'll come in tomorrow. Well, she met me at the lab the next day. She'd been doing some homework. She was a high school English teacher. She got on the internet that night and found 12 articles that mentioned do not use pulse shortwave diathermy over metal. But she was a very spiritual lady. She prayed about this and felt that it might just be okay, and I'm glad she did. She came in the next day. We took some range of motion measurements. Well, I'll get to there. Well, jumping ahead. She was lacking, again, 32 degrees of extension. She hadn't moved for months, not one degree for months. So what we did after we took the measurements, we did the pulse shortwave diathermy for 15 minutes, and then I did, a, did about 10 minutes of joint mobilizations. Here's the results of those joint mobilizations. She started, I'm sorry, at 28 degrees of extension. On that first treatment, she got to 21. Remember, she hadn't moved one degree in months. 
she got tears in her eyes and started crying for joy. And inside I was going, yeah, I was excited, okay? We then had her come in two days later and she started at 23 degrees, uh, which is often typical. They, get, they lose a few degrees and then she got down to 16. Then on day three, she came in at 18, finished at 12. On day four, again, we kind of hit a roadblock. She started at 18 degrees, got down to 12. On day five, she started at 14, got down to seven. And on day six, just 12 days after, the, after the, we first saw her, she went from 10 degrees of extension, clear down to three. That's incredible. She, she was very happy. I said, I don't know if we can restore any more range of motion. Will you be happy with the last three degrees? And she said, yes, I will. So that was a good, good thing to, uh, to follow. So uh, here's her picture. This is before and this is after. So she gained all but three degrees back. Now I've followed her several times. Um, now she is playing volleyball. And uh, boy, I watched that game with Brazil and Russia. That was a heartbreaker. I was cheering for you guys. Boy. Anyway, she now plays volleyball. She plays racquetball. She does gardening. And now she has full range of motion in her elbow. And we really owe that to the science of shortwave diathermy and um, joint mobilizations. Whoa. I've got another slide. I don't know how that happened. Gotta have my videos now. Okay, I have uh, been lucky enough to treat a lot of people with adhesive capsulitis. They basically got a frozen shoulder that won't move very much. And my theory is if we can heat that capsule enough and then apply joint mobilizations, we can restore that range of motion. So here I've got a case of an individual where I did that. This individual here is a 40-year-old gentleman, actually a physical therapy assistant. And he had a frozen shoulder of no, uh, no known mechanism. It just over time began to freeze up. And so what we did with him, we came in and took pre-treatment measurements. We then applied two diathermy drums, one on the anterior aspect and one on the posterior aspect for 15 minutes. Then we did uh, joint mobilizations. We did that every day for six days and we tracked his changes in range of motion. So hopefully this video will work. I have to come over here and click it. Okay, this is showing his unaffected arm there. This is showing his affected arm. So he's at about 100 degrees of abduction. Six days later, this is what he looked like. There's his unaffected arm. Here's his injured arm. Pretty remarkable, pretty exciting. Okay, as you can see in that first picture, his left arm goes to full flexion. His right arm, he's still lacking about 50 degrees of flexion. Then we go over here, this is again six days later after six treatments. There's his unaffected arm. Here's his affected arm. Okay, this is extension. There's his pre-extension. And as we do that range of motion, we look at that on the first one. That's his unaffected arm. That's his affected arm. He's really lacking a lot of extension. After six days, after six treatments, got all of his extension back.
There's one more slide I need you for, Rena. You need to see internal and external rotation because it was quite remarkable. He hardly had any external and internal rotation. It was almost painful to watch. So there's normal external rotation. Here's the opposite arm. He's really frozen. Really frozen. Again, after our regimen of pulse shortwave diathermy and joint mobilizations, this was restored as you'll see now. Quite remarkable. Diathermy is very safe to use. It's very easy to use. It's a little expensive. Machines can cost anywhere from 5,000 to 25,000 American dollars. I don't know what that translates to Brie, but it's, it's worth it because your people will get better. And by word of mouth, they'll hear that this therapist over here uses this protocol to you if they know that you have this science and this device available. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.